This video will cover section 2.6, rational functions and their graph. Uh, so let's start by writing a, the definition of rational functions. So rational functions are quotients of polynomial functions Uh, and we will refer to those quotients as p of x divided by q of x. So just to remind you, when we talk about rational numbers, those are the quotients of two integers. So it's an integer divided by an integer. So when we mention rational functions, it just makes sense that we're going to have the quotients of two polynomial functions. And remember, we used to use, uh, use the letter P for polynomials. So for the second polynomial, we use the letter Q. Okay, so now let's talk about the domain of a rational function. So the domain of a rational function is the set of all real numbers except the x values that make the denominator equal zero. So what that means is that we need to exclude all those numbers that will cause a denominator to equal to zero because then that will be undefined. So let's use the example here and you can see that the polynomial on the numerator uh, that is p of x, the polynomial on the denominator is q of x so that forms a rational function and um, to our advantage, the denominator is already in factor form. So what I need to do to find the domain is take each factor and equal it to zero. So my first factor is x is equal to zero. So we're going to say x cannot be zero for the domain. The second factor will be x minus two cannot equal to zero. So x cannot equal to positive two. And with the third factor, we have x plus 5 cannot equal to 0, so x cannot equal to negative 5. <clears throat> so then the domain for the, the, this particular function is going to be all real numbers except for those three, uh, 0, 2, and negative 5. Okay, so now what I want you guys to do is I want you to solve part A and part B. Uh, you could use a partner, use the partner that it is uh, behind or in front of you. You don't have a partner. And so I'm going to pause the video and then we will um, unpause it when we're ready to check our work. Okay, so part A, we um, found that x cannot equal to 3 and you can give your answer in set notation or interval notation. For part B, I saw that some of you were factoring um, the x squared minus 9. So that is the difference of squares. It could be x plus 3 times x minus 3. That cannot equal 0. And then you take each factor. Um, x plus 3 cannot equal 0. So x cannot equal negative 3, and the other one was x minus 3 cannot equal 0, so x cannot equal positive 3. Uh, from here, if you want to give your answer as an interval, it will be from negative infinity to negative 3 union, negative 3 to positive 3 union from 3 to infinity. Uh, if you want to use interval notation, I'm sorry, set notation, Uh, that will be any x such that x belongs to the set of real numbers and x does not equal 3 or negative 3. That will be enough.
Now, I wanted to do C with you guys because, um, well, first of all, there's another way to solve this one. I don't know if any of you did it that way, but I'll write it down. You could take the denominator and say that cannot equal zero. Now, if we consider the, na the 9 is subtracting to the x squared, and we move that across, it will be x squared cannot equal positive 9. Now, from here, how do we undo a square? Square root, right? And so we know that um, the square root will take care of the square because they're inverse operations. But 9 has two square roots. What are those? Plus 3 and negative 3. Thank you. So those are the same numbers, right, that we're getting here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to do the problem the same way as this. So I take the denominator and say that cannot equal to 0. Uh, and so once I move the positive 9 to the right side, that will be a negative 9. Now here what I'm going to do is take the square root to undo the square. And that will take care of the square. So we will have, we will have an x. And so that, uh, in the set of real numbers, we will say there is no real solution. So to answer that particular question, the domain will be any x such that x belongs to the set of real numbers with no restriction. As an interval, what would it be as an interval of real numbers? From negative infinity to positive infinity. And that is because we're saying there's no real solution to that inequality, um, and therefore there are no restrictions. And think about it, uh, it doesn't matter what number we choose for x, for example, um, Jasmine, give me a negative number. Negative. negative 3. So if we say negative 3 squared plus 9, we will get 9 plus 9, and that will be 18, right? We're not going to get a 0. Um, Adelina, give me a positive number. Uh, 5. 5. So 5 squared plus 9, so that will be 25 plus 9 which is equal to 36. So it doesn't matter if you select a positive or a negative number for x, any number that you choose for x will work. So therefore, there is no x value that will make that denominator equal to 0. Yes? Is that clear? All right. So let's move on to the next uh, slide. OK, so we have the most basic rational function. is the reciprocal function. And it is defined by f of x is equal to 1 over x. The denominator cannot be 0. So the domain of f is the set of all real numbers. Except zero. And so the graph of this function, what I have here is um, I have the left side of the graph and I have the right side of the graph. Uh, just as a quick reference, that graph looks like this. So we actually say that it has. It has that vertical asymptote, and we're going to cover that in a minute, in case you don't remember. That vertical asymptote at x is equal to 0. Okay, so with your calculators, I'm going to ask you that you divide 1 by the x values that you are given here. Um, so, let's see. Who's ready with the calculator? Okay, Peru. No, that, that's too easy. I'll do the first one. So 1 divided by negative 1 
that is equal to negative 1. So if I will use the next one, 1 divided by negative 0.5. <coughs> negative 2. Negative 2. Thank you. Okay, Emily, 1 divided by negative 0.1. Negative 10. Negative 10. Um, Biryani, 1 divided by negative 0.01. <coughs> negative 100. Negative 100. Sean, 1 divided by negative 0.001. Negative 1,000. Okay, so what do you guys notice about the function values, in other words, the y values? Well, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that question. As x approaches 0 from the left, so this is what we mean. We, um, let's say that negative 1 is here. <coughs> and then we went for negative 0.5. And then we went to negative 0.1. Uh, yeah, actually, I like the way you said that. So as the x values decrease, they're approaching 0. No, actually, they're increasing. That's what you said, right? Um, so as x approaches 0 from the left, the y values are, you said, decreasing, right? So they are getting smaller. Now, don't let the absolute value of the number uh, confuse you, because I know we're going, if we just consider the absolute value as 1, 2, 10, 100, 1,000, so you might be inclined to think they're getting larger, but we're talking about negative numbers, so think about they're getting more and more negative, so in other words, they're getting smaller, or they are decreasing. Now, if we were to choose numbers, a number for x, and let's choose 1, negative point zero 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 one and I want um, Jonathan I want you to divide that so divide one by that number you know what else you can see if, if you know it's the zeros you just have to flip the number and it becomes the one like on the hundred it, you just flip and take out the decimal oh that's true like one hundred so what is it? What? Negative one million. Okay, pretty good. So do you guys see that they get smaller and smaller? And so if we keep getting closer and closer to zero, the y values tend to decrease, and they're decreasing without bound. So in other words, they're going to negative infinity. So now here we're going to use this new type of notation that is actually going to be pretty helpful when you guys get to calculus. If you can understand this, you will be pretty good with the first part of calculus, which is limits. So we're going to say that as x approaches 0 from the left, so that little negative that is on top, it looks like an exponent, that's what it means. It means from the left, just like we say here the function value approaches negative infinity. Okay, now let's see what's happening on the right side of zero. And so I want, who has the calculator ready? Well, I'll do the first one. Oh, no, not that. I'll do the last one. One divided by one, oops, is one. Okay, Chris, next one, 1 divided by 0. 0.5. 0. 0. Yes. 2. Um, yes. Well, actually, let me ask someone from this side. Yes. 1 divided by 0. 0.1. 0. 1. Leslie, 1 divided by 0 0.01. 17. 
Crystal, 1 divided by 0 0.001. 1,000. So now, as x approaches 0 from the right, uh, you can see that our function values or y values, they are getting larger, right? Or they are increasing. And so if we keep going, getting closer and closer to x equals 0, you will see that they will get larger and larger. And if you follow the, the graph, you can see that they are going towards what? Infinity. So we're going to say that as x approaches 0 from the right, the function, yeah, and that's why I use the plus. That means from the right. It's like a little exponent. But it just means from the left or from the right. So then the function value approaches positive infinity. And this thing actually translates pretty nicely um, to limits. And I know you guys have seen uh, Mean Girls, right? Are you serious? Okay, we have to watch that movie. Um, not anytime soon. <laughs> but there's something called the left left side limit. Okay, I'm still talking. So uh, we will consider the function. Uh, if you have space for it, yes. 1 over x. And so the left side limit will be what is the limit of f of x as x approaches 0 from the left. And so you guys already know that was negative infinity, right? <coughs> now if we talk about the right side limit, That will be the limit of f of x as x approaches 0 from the right, and that will be positive infinity. Now, if the question is, what is the limit of this function as x approaches 0? So, because the left side limit and the right side limit are different, then the actual limit does not exist. So you guys remember that moment from Mean Girls? Yeah, the limit does not exist. Of course, the problem was not that problem. Um, I, I searched it and it was something more complex. But I mean, you could remember that. OK, going back to the PowerPoint, uh, what we have here, and we call, <clears throat> we call this arrow notation. And we have here, well, let me, if we have some number and we have that positive, that means that x is approaching that particular number from the right. Now, if we have a number and then we have that negative sign, that means that x is approaching that particular number from the left. Now, the next problem, um, we're going to say x approaches infinity. So that will be something like this. I'm sorry. The other way. To approach infinity. Um, and what we say there is that x increases without bound. That means x keeps getting larger and larger. Uh, for the other one, When we have x approaches negative infinity, we go in this direction, and that means that x decreases without bound. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Arrow notation. You will have a, a problem like that on your test. 
Okay, so get your calculators ready now. And I just want to show you quickly how this graph Well, it is the, the same graph that we were talking about. I just like decided to split it into two. So let's see what's happening on the left side. So for this one, this is going to answer the question as x approaches in negative infinity. So we're going in this direction towards negative infinity. So if we divide 1 divided by negative 1, we will get negative 1, right? One divided by negative one. Okay. Now, if we divide one by negative ten, we get point zero one. Okay. Now, Andrea, I want you to divide one divided by negative one hundred. <laughs> Uh huh. Very good. And then Chris. I'm going to ask on the graph. Can we still assume that it's infinity even if there's no arrow at the end of the at the end of the line? Oh, like that one? Like how? Okay, so where you have the, the blue arrow uh -huh. directly underneath it, the actual graph, how there's no little arrow right there at the end of it, can we still assume it's infinity? Negative one. From the previous slide. No, from this one here. Yeah. Like you're saying, if there was no arrow here? No. No, there was no, 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 no
you're always going to get a number that it gets smaller and smaller, closer to zero, but it's not going to be negative. So let's see if this is true. Um, Jose, I want you to divide 1 over 1 million. Do you get in scientific notation? See? So it doesn't matter how large your denominator becomes, this number is not going to be negative. This is going to get smaller and smaller, in other words, it's going to approach zero. Okay, so we're going to write a little definition here. Was that? Okay, so as x approaches, that is the same thing that we've been saying. As x approaches infinity, or in arrow notation, x approaches infinity, or as x approaches negative infinity. Uh, with arrow notation, it looks like that. The function value values are approaching zero. And the question that we have here, uh, that is actually a question from your homework. I'm going to give you a few minutes to work it out with your partner, and you could also expect to have a question like that on the on the exam. So please get them right. Okay? So please, I'm going to give you like about three minutes, and then we'll check our answers. to that asymptote on the left side, the function values or the y values are going to negative infinity. So that is what goes here. For the next part, we have a little plus here, so that means from the right. So we look at the right side of the same asymptote, and if you look at what's happening to the graph, that is going up to positive infinity. Now the next question says uh, x approaches 1 from the left. So you look at the left side of that asymptote and you see they're going down to negative infinity. The next one is from the right. So you look at this part of the graph and you see that it is going up to positive infinity. Now for the last two, Uh, where the first one, x is approaching negative infinity, that means the x values are decreasing. So now I'm going to look at this part of the graph. 
And just in case you haven't seen it, there is a horizontal asymptote here on the x-axis. Or, in other words, the line y, y equals 0. So that graph, if we were to extend the, the x-axis, uh, you will see that the graph is not going to touch the x-axis. So the function values will just get smaller and smaller until we say they approach 0. And now for the next one, as x approaches infinity, that means that it goes in this direction. The x values get larger. Uh, we're also going to say that the y values are approaching 0. Okay, do we, have, do we have a question before I move on to the next one? Yes? So if it's ever, as x approaches infinity or negative infinity, it has to always be 0 um, for vertical asymptotes, yes. For horizontal asymptotes, it could change depending on where your horizontal asymptote is located at. Yes, it could move up and down because rational functions uh, also follow the transformations that we talk about, like the vertical shifting, horizontal shifting. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, Vertical asymptotes of rational functions. And then after we answer the problems related to this, we'll go take a break. So the line x is equal to a is a vertical asymptote of the graph of a function f if f of x increases or decreases Without bounds. So that kind of answers your question, Chris. Chris? Oh, I was call you Chris again. Um, increases or decreases without bounds. So, like we say, increases. I mean, uh, that means that f of x is appro approaching positive infinity. If we say decreases without bound, that means that f of x is approaching negative infinity. Uh, so, without bound, as x approaches whatever the value is for that particular vertical asymptote, which in this case we're using the letter A to generalize it uh, as a real number. And so we have the example here with graphs. Uh, in this case we have the function approaching positive infinity. Here we have the function also approaching positive infinity. Here we have the function approaching negative infinity. And here we have the function approaching negative infinity as well. Um, now you can see here nicely how they are also translated to limits. And that's what I was explaining on the other one. I know that it's very small, especially on your slide. But right here it says the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the right. And that is positive infinity. Um, and bless you. An example here will be the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left. And so the answer is negative infinity. And Robert can tell you that you see that in calculus, right? This is the first chapter. First chapter, yes. So if you could get at least a visual idea of it, um, that will save you a little bit of time. Of course, you still need to know how to do an algebraic group. limits. Okay, so here's another uh, a way to find the vertical asymptotes. But if you feel confident about finding the domain of a rational function, then that you shouldn't have a problem finding the vertical asymptotes because those same numbers that we restrict from the domain, those are actually going to be the vertical asymptotes of your function. Uh, before we do that, we also need to verify that the function 
uh, the rational function, remember we said it was a ratio of two polynomials. So we need to make sure that those two polynomials um, have no common factors. And we will explain that in a minute. So let's go to the next slide. And we have three different functions here. I already have the graphs for you. So you can see example A is going to have two vertical asymptotes. Example B only has one. And example C has no, uh, none. So, okay. So if we take, remember for the domain, uh, for this particular function, the two restrictions that we had was 3 and negative 3. And this is the same problem that we did at the beginning for domain. So those same numbers that you are restricting from the domain are going to form your vertical asymptote. So x is equal to 3 and x is equal to negative 3. <coughs> Now the next one, remember how the statement from the previous slide, it says something about no common factors, right? Right here. So what I'm going to do first before I, well, let's go ahead and write down the domain. The domain for this function is the same as uh, the previous function. So you have to restrict positive 3 and also negative 3. However, I'm going to factor the denominator and I can factor it as a difference of squares. And you can see that x plus 3 and x plus 3 uh, is equal to 1, so we may say they cancel. So this function, g of x, becomes 1 over x minus 3. However, for the domain, we still need to consider the original function. So the domain of this function, even in reduced form, it is still x cannot equal 3 and x cannot equal negative 3 for the domain because we're going from the original. But to find the vertical asymptotes, the only asymptote will be x is equal to 3, the one that comes from here. That will be your vertical asymptote. So what happens with the other restriction of the domain? And for that, I'm talking about this particular number. So even though it doesn't become uh, an asymptote, it will become an open circle or a hole on the graph. So remember, an open circle, that means not included, right? And if it's a solid line, that means it is included. So every single x value here is included except for that one and positive 3. So in other words, the num the factor that gets canceled, that's the one that will give you the hole or open circle. Any questions about that? We're going to do one more like that. So let's go to problem C. And you can see from the graph, there are no horizontal asymptotes there. And so remember, when we did something similar like that on the first, first or second slide, uh, for the domain, we decided that the domain was all real numbers. In other words, there were no restrictions for the x values. And so for the vertical asymptotes here, we will just say none, or you could say any. 
So we're going to pause the video and we're going to go take a quick break. Only three minutes. So we're moving on to the next slide and we're going to write a little definition here. A value where the denominator of a rational function is zero does not necessarily result in a vertical asymptote. And we're going to see one more example here. So remember to find the vertical asymptotes. The first step is to see if the numerator and denominator have common factors. So here the numerator is a difference of squares with the factor as x plus 2 times x minus 2. The denominator is x minus 2. So one thing that we could do here, let's do uh, the x minus 2, x minus 2 equal to 1, so we may say they cancel. So that number, if we take that x minus 2 equals 0, and then solve for x, that number right there is going to, is going to give us the uh, open circle or the hole. And that will be here. Because if we reduce this one, we will just have x plus 2. <coughs> However, for the domain, for the domain, um, we still have to exclude positive two. But since on the reduced form, we get something that is that it looks like a linear function. In fact, it, it is. But the original function is a rational function. So we have no vertical asymptotes because there's no value that will make this expression be undefined. Instead of having a vertical asymptote, we will have that open circle at x equals 2. So we're going to write the following. The value x equals 2 causes the denominator to be 0. That's why we exclude it from the domain. But there is a reduced form. Of the function. Equation. in which 2 does not cause the expression to be undefined. Um, so there is no vertical asymptote. Instead, there is a hole corresponding to x equals 2 and not a vertical asymptote. Um, we also refer to those as discontinuities. continuity. So it's something that makes the function not be continuous. Okay, now we're going to talk about horizontal asymptotes. Do we have a question on this particular problem before I move on? Anyone? Do you like me to rephrase it? No? Okay. Horizontal asymptotes of rational functions. Oh, by the way, if you couldn't make it to the review yesterday, I posted a video on YouTube. It's not a very good video, but I mean, I'm not a pro. So, but if you are curious about what kind of questions, 
Uh, the practice exam that we were looking at was from last year. That one didn't have a question on the intermediate value theorem, but I can tell you right now that you will have a question on that for sure. So make sure you check that on your notes. Okay, so going back to rational functions, horizontal asymptotes of rational functions, the line y equals b is a horizontal asymptote. of the graph of the function of the function f if f of x approaches b that is the number that we're using here for the horizontal asymptote just to generalize it. As x increases, or decreases, without bound. So going back to the example that we did uh, close to the beginning, when we say x increases without bounds, that means x approaches infinity. And when we say x decreases without bounds, that means x approaches negative infinity. <coughs> and so now we have here an example of three functions with horizontal asymptotes. And here you can see um, as x approaches positive infinity or increases without bounds, the function value is approaching this particular number for the horizontal asymptote, which we will just use b to generalize it. And that is the same thing that you have written here. Now, one thing to consider is that horizontal asymptotes, they could be crossed at times, like the example you see here. Not too often, but it does happen. Vertical asymptotes that will never be crossed by the graph. Okay, so let's go to the next slide and so we know how to find them. So let S be a rational function given by, and then we have something that looks a little weird. However, we already know that functions, rational functions, are defined as the ratio of two polynomials, right? And if you guys recall from section, I believe it was 2.3, we started by defining a polynomial and it looked like something like this one here. And so I'm going to refer that as the numerator. So for that numerator, we have something called the leading coefficient. What is the leading coefficient? The, well, the, that is a sub n, right? That is the leading coefficient. This number here. And we have another thing called n, and n represents what? It is the highest power of the polynomial, so it is the exponent, the degree. So now let's look at the right side. Well, not the right side, but the bottom. So that is going to be the denominator. And for that denom uh, denominator, we cannot use a sub n or n. Instead, we're going to use b sub m. And that is going to represent the leading coefficient of the denominator. And the degree for this one will be the letter M. And so I'm going to explain this because um, that's how the three types of horizontal asymptotes or cases, um, they are worded in terms of M and A sub M, A sub N and B sub M. So let's look at the first one. The first one, it says, if n is less than m, 
So, or M is greater than M. So which degree is higher, the numerator or the denominator? Denominator, right? So you girls, or maybe you boys, have heard the terms top heavy, bottom heavy, maybe? Like a girl would say here. Okay. So we're going to think of this as a bottom heavy. It's just an easy way to remember. Bottom heavy because the denominator of the the degree of the denominator is higher than the degree of the numerator. So when that happens, by default, the horizontal asymptote becomes, becomes the line y equals zero, or the x-axis. An example of a function like that could be the reciprocal function, because what is the degree of the numerator? Uh-uh. Zero. Zero. And what is the degree of the denominator? A 1. Here it's like we have an x to the 0. Okay. Now let's look at the other one. I like to talk about number 3 first. So number 3, which degree is higher, the numerator or denominator? Numerator. Numerator. So we're going to call this top heavy. I'm not going to ask you what that translates into in real life. So if that is the case, if n is greater than m, then we have no horizontal asymptote. <laughs> so let me give you an example. Let's say x squared plus 9, and then here we have x minus 1. So you can see that the degree of the numerator is higher than the degree of the denominator. So it is top heavy. Now, condition number two, it says that n and m is equal. So what am I saying there? The degrees? They're, the degrees are equal. So we're going to call them same degree. So would that mean like the bottom? I guess so. Put the bottom heavy again. <laughs> An hourglass figure. Okay. So now we have, we have, oh, let me tell you what happens there. So the horizontal asymptote, if that is the case, same degree, you will have to get the ratio of the leading coefficient. So we take the ratio of the leading coefficient. Okay, so let's see the first example. Is that a top heavy, bottom heavy? Bottom heavy. <laughs> right, the degree of the denominator is a 2, the degree of the numerator is a 1. So because of that, do we look at condition number 1, 2, or 3? Number 1. So what is the horizontal asymptote here? Zero. Uh -huh. Now, if you're talking about a horizontal asymptote, make sure you use the variable y. Because if you say x equals 0, that will be wrong. Because x equals to a number represents vertical lines. And I don't want you to count, to count I don't want to count those points um, incorrect on your test. Okay, next, uh, next problem. Is that bottom heavy, top heavy, same degree? What is it? Same, same, same degree. degree. So because it is same degree, what do we need to do? So there's these four lines. Uh -huh. So we get the ratio of the leading coefficient. So the horizontal asymptote will be y equals 4 divided by 2. So it will be 2. And you can see that picture here. And the last problem that we have here, top heavy. top heavy. So if we go by condition number three, we can see that there is no horizontal asymptote. So NA? Uh-huh, you can say NA or none. How do we answer this one? 
Like that. Oh, I'm not sure because I've never done the homework on my math lab. No. Okay. All right. So uh, just to keep it fair, I'm going to stop lecturing here. And then um, I'm still going to record the remaining of the lesson because it will still be on your homework. However, you don't need to worry about that until after the test because section 2.6 is not due until the 27th, Tuesday, October 27th. Yes.